I graduated in 2008 from Duke University, but I actually started my first company when I was in school. Um, that was a lot of fun, like a bunch of 19 year olds charging away at their, on their computers doing silly things. Um, lots of uh, experience learning the hard way, like I was saying before. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, the background is, you know, when you're just out of school, you don't really get a lot of, you don't really do a lot of professional training, in, in especially in like a truly academic setting, so yeah. All the things that I've learned about quality that I'm going to be talking about today are really things that I've like that have been hammered home by having lots of real world experience have been thrust upon me. Um, so uh, I'm now uh, yeah. So I've been so I've been doing this I guess maybe I guess only like five years now. So but um, a lot of really fairly tenable, uh, tangible lessons uh, to convey. So um, and I know there's going to be a lot of questions on this topic because quality is a very abstract, fluffy thing. So yeah, I'm happy to. I'll have a bigger question session at the end than I think a normal session would. Um, so, and then I guess um, about you guys, what I sort of would uh, be looking for, or maybe just, I mean, I think this is a fairly open presentation. I think anybody could really be in this. Uh, but, you know, I, ma I imagine that you're either a, a manager or possibly an engineer. Um, uh, maybe you're on the quality assurance team at your company. You could be the CEO of the company. Frankly, actually, I think if there were CEOs in this room, that'd be fantastic because I think every CEO should listen to this presentation or at least some of the concepts in it. Um, uh, I, I would sort of hope that if you're, you know, if you're at a startup, maybe you're living with growing pains. Maybe this is something that you're sort of experiencing right now, like you're just sort of dealing with the ongoing maintenance and burden of like you're adding new people and you're adding new software and your features are growing like crazy and like you have like everything is pulling in every direction all at once and you should just be feeling that strain. Um, if you're, you know, excited and or maybe just worried about how your product is doing, like relative to the world, like what do people think about it? Like, do I know enough about how people think about it? Right? Like, and are we doing a good enough job of quality? Like, am I scared that maybe the like number of bugs on my site or on my mobile app or whatever are like actually too high for people to like keep coming back? So what? What are we? What, I'm like nervous about that. That's what I would sort of expect from that. Um, the uh, sort of a little bit more startup be here, but like, uh, if you want to scale your company without getting, you know, big company culture, right, like this is maybe a concern you might have, and this is actually a very real one that I know a lot of people I've met have, uh, when they start seeing that they have to hire, like, you know, a hundred people in the next year, I mean, that's like a wild change from having ten people in your company, so like, I mean, people get scared about process, and they get scared about bureaucracy, and like, basically we're going to, you know, um, I would imagine that that would be something on uh, people's minds. Um, also, just one note. I mean, um, I'm happy to take questions, but let's let's keep them at the end so that I just so we can we'll push them all together and then have like one big session. Um, okay. And then I guess the last thing is uh, this is very programming programmer side, but like trying to balance out uh, you know planning ahead in your code base or planning ahead in your infrastructure with like cargo cult programming where you're like totally overstructuring things. Um, I think that that balance is maybe a little bit of a fear for more seasoned people. I, I think lots of again like early developers, I think they tend to just go for it, but then if you've ever um, read the second system effect um, uh, in, the myth in the mythical man month, it's all about how developers tend to in their second system like just bloat it like crazy because they way over plan so they swing the other direction of not planning anything um, so I think that there's some there's a risk in general with this last bullet I think it's very engineering for specific so but anyway maybe you're worried about all these things and I, um, this would be this is hopefully a presentation that will make sense for you um, so yeah, let me give you some context about when I joined Box specifically, since lots of the context for this presentation comes from Box and my experiences there. When I joined, there were about 40 engineers, um, and it's over 120 today. Um, so lots and lots of new training, lots of new talking to people and getting to know how people work and like getting them familiar with our technology. Uh, what that that's that's a that's been a big challenge, I guess, for Box is like how do you tell people about our like 50,000 line code base who have like, you know, programmed in PHP at their internship last summer and now they're like, they're freshly, they're fresh faced college grads and you need to like, get them to know the industry standards like fast in order to actually, you know, get everything running fast and that's, that's a big challenge. Um, lots of pain around technical debt um, and you know, technical debt, doesn't, technical debt doesn't always, doesn't completely go away ever, um, but yeah, I mean, especially back then, uh, there wasn't any one specific way to tackle technical debt, like how do you actually say, well, technical debt is a big problem, and how do you actually uh, quantify its problematicness, right? That was a big problem, and, and then just, uh, you know, dealing with it. Um, the weekly release, so we actually release every week. It's actually not a bad 
Um, this is not too bad when I started. Uh, we did, we already had essentially the whole quality assurance cycle and release process pretty much in rhythm. Uh, so this is a really good starting point for where uh, we started going from here. Um, but yeah, I mean, having a solid release process in general is going to be very valuable uh, as this goes forward. But, um, uh, and then uh, with a very low bus factor. Does anybody know what bus factor means? It's the number of people that would need to be like hit by a bus in order for your company to sink into the ocean, right? Um, the the very low number bus factor indicated that we, you know we had maybe like three architects who like had built most of the system and who had been working together for I mean Box is six years old, right? So it, they'd been working together for years and years, and then suddenly we start hiring all these people, and they were like, I don't really know how to talk to other people, and then it just you know it was very hard to permeate all that knowledge uh, out from those guys. Um, so that was just something that we were concerned about. Again, hiring went crazy, and it seemed impossible to slow down, right? With our product requirements, especially Boxbox is an enterprise company, so we just have tons of requirements coming in all the time from our partners, really specific business cases that needed to be tackled, and they were necessary for us to get those contracts. So yeah, we were just going in all directions at all times, and it was just sort of wild. Um, so uh, that's the context around this. And, and so yeah, I mean, the gist for this whole presentation is going to be about, you know, kind of what the hell is quality, and like, how do I get it? Um, because this is going to be partly about like defining how, how do we come up with a good way to describe quality, and how do we actually infuse it into a culture that could be it could be years and years old. It could be it could be totally different than when you start. Is there a way that you can incrementally add quality? And I'd like to hope that there is because I think we were able to do it at Box, and this is sort of also the story of Box. Um, yeah. So our agenda is just three bullet points. Uh, what is quality? This is going to be. One. Um, and then uh, what is the culture of quality, which is also exciting, but total, for a totally different reason. Um, and then the question of how do you build one. And this is going to be half just like a general thought process around what traditional QA looks like and how you get to something a little bit better. Um, and then part this will bleed into the questions where we start talking about like maybe your cases that you guys have experienced or just general questions about quality in general, uh, maybe specific problems uh, in implementation. So first let's talk about what quality actually could be defined as, or how do we actually explain what quality is. Um, uh, so yeah, this is obviously a very hard question, right? There's actually, um, if you've ever read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, the guy like goes crazy because he's trying to define quality, right? And like he, he loses his mind in the process. So um, the, uh, it's, it's not easy to define it. So let's constrain our variables a little bit. Let's just call this uh, you know, software product quality for the, for the duration of this presentation. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's lots of conflicting ways to describe quality. I think what, how an engineer describes quality might be different than how our CEO describes quality, um, which, you know, is, this, is, this is sort of a situation where uh, Aaron, our CEO, he uh, is very product involved. He's very much in, in the process of, like, actually uh, talking to engineers and talking to our salespeople and trying to develop the products specifically. He's not like a CFO type or a CMO type. He's, he's, he's very much in, in the application itself trying to make it work really well. Um, so yeah, uh, he's got a very interesting sense of humor too. Um, so uh, okay, well that, that's one way to describe quality, but what's the official definition of quality according to software? Um, well, okay, so we have our friend Dr. Bill Curtis here. He works with the consortium, or works with the consortium for IT software quality, and sort of described software quality as consisting of these five key points, right? It's reliable, and it's efficient, and it's secure, maintainable code base, and the size of the software system is manageable, essentially, right? Like, the, you don't want a very large uh, software system because that implies lower quality. Okay, so, um, <coughs> so these same, I think all these are like fairly in, intuitively obvious, or at least intuitively make sense, and I think you could describe these to anybody and they'd be like, yes, I understand these, this, you should have secure software, yes. But, um, but it's hard to totally suss out what the like actionable, points are from this, right? Like, how do you decide between, well, I need to fix this bug, or I need to make this faster, or I need to actually make this more secure because there's a possible vulnerability, um, uh, what is the sort of, what do we measure, what do we actually decide on, and how do we actually quantify some of these variables? Because, you know, you can pick and choose from these two and not be able to achieve all five. That's actually probably one of those golden rules of software that, I don't know, you, you can't get all five of these. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. It's hard to measure, it's hard to even see just with these points by themselves. So, how do we ask maybe some better questions about what quality could be defined as? Um, well, the first question that's pretty uh, good to ask yourself is, you know, what does it mean for my software to work well? 
So I asked this in the context of, you know, Box is sort of an enterprise software company. For us to work well means that it's always up and that it's super secure, right? That's Security is a huge focus at Box, and we spend a, a, a lot of effort trying to make sure that our product is very secure. I'm very happy with our security of our product, but um, the, it has to be there for our software to con be considered to work well. You can't have an enterprise document storage solution that has security vulnerabilities, or has the ability to, you know, oops, you don't need to type in your password when you log in. Like, that's, we can't have that, right? That's, like, not something that we can define our, our software as working well on. Um, does it matter if it's a huge code base? Um, maybe. Right? Like, there's, so, like, okay, so now we're like, like relatively measuring. I think security is pretty important. I think maintainability is probably pretty important. Um, it sort of gives us a little bit of a barometer for what, how, to, how to measure these different things. Um, how important is it for my software to work well is uh, related, right? Like, again, if there's a security vulnerability, then somebody could, that hacks the site, right? If, that, if, if security is even just the tiniest bit lax, our whole product is gone, right? Like, there's, we can't sell a product that has had a security vulnerability. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a problem that you should ask of your own situation, right? Like, is, is the software that I'm working on right now actually something that needs to work well um, in order for my customers to be happy and for uh, the product to actually be successful? Um, and a third thing, you know, this is also something maybe an engineer would ask themselves is like, are people working and getting things done? Or do they seem stuck? I mean, do you, this is actually something that maybe is intuitively obvious to a, possibly a product manager, too. I mean, you ask the developers to do something, and then six months later, they're like, uh, we kind of got it done, but it's got all these holes. It's kind of like that diagram of the tire on the ground with the, with the ropes too long. Like, it's just like not what people expected. And I mean, that, um, that happens. And, it, it, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, you have this vague perception that maybe developers aren't as efficient as they could be or that they're just stuck doing something. Um, and then there's other companies where you just see developers are churning out code. Like, nobody thinks of Facebook. And if you know anything about Facebook, Facebook's release process is insanely fast. And everybody at Facebook claims that they get a ton of code done on a daily basis. So uh, it's from like you can tell there that, that people are getting stuff done. So this is a perception thing. It's a very qualitative thing, but it it, it, does, it has some relationship with uh, software quality, I think. And um, so I want to say that all three of these things are all tied to one uh, very important in, in very in the universe, and that's uh, time. Uh, time consumed by developers. Time consumed by uh, engineers are time consumed by uh, just fixing bugs, uh, getting through the code reprocess, going through hiring, all that stuff. I think time is the sort of central component to lots of the things that we talk about when we're talking about quality, right? Like, uh, it's effectively, I think, it's something that applies to a lot of the metrics that, we, that we're going to talk about. Um, so uh, the other important thing about time, just in terms of considering how uh, we measure it, is that if time is uh, actually it happens to be uh, money for most people. Um, uh, so you know, developers don't like spending time turning on bugs, and so they complain about the amount of time taken. But then, correspondingly, like anybody that is in your like C level work can be like, yes, they're spending so much money trying to fix bugs. Like time just gets equated equated to money. And so this is actually going to be very helpful because what it's going to, what's going to happen is we're going to be able to use money and time as a way to measure uh, quality in a very rough way, but in a way that will actually let us get things done that are, that are going to move our organization forward. Um, so I'm going to make a quick assumption here, and that is that, uh, let's say your product has a bug, and if it's worth addressing, it's going to get fixed, right? I can pretty much guarantee you that bugs that exist in your software system that are like important, that are claims about how your product should work, um, like that are, being, that are actually varying as a result of a bug, will get fixed. They have to be, right? Until your company goes bankrupt or way after it gets acquired, there will always, if there's software that you have that has a bug that needs to be fixed, it will be fixed. So you can think about a bug as being a sunk cost. Does that track with everybody? You're going, if you have a bug that it exists in your system and it needs to be fixed, it is essentially a cost that you will have to pay. So a question is, you know, how many bugs are you releasing? That can totally equate directly to how much it costs to actually fix that bug. But not just how many bugs, but actually how, how long it takes to fix an individual bug. So this is to get some intuition around on, on bugs. And so from this, I'm actually going to take us to, the, to my actionable property of quality. This is um, not a definition of quality by any means. You can define quality in lots and lots of ways. But this is one property of quality that I think has actually made it very easy for me to like build metrics and, and support systems around a quality insurance organization. And that is that quality is just the inversely relational to the sum of all costs to engineering. So Q is 
proportional to one over dollar sign of W. So um, what, why so broad, right? Like that's that's a huge number of things that there's a lot of other stuff that goes on into this measure uh, that you may not necessarily associate with the QA organization, right? Like this is this is maybe way too broad. Um, well, uh, I mean, you should be able to measure against anything the engineering organization creates uh, against the value it generates, right? That's a big deal. Um, and I mean, remember that QA organizations aren't created by this by the like company in order to like reduce the number of bugs per release. I mean, yes, they are, but the mo most of the time, people are thinking very aspirationally when they build an quality assurance organization, right? People are saying, "I want the quality of my software to be like apples, right? I want it to be literally the most solid, look clean. People just need to think of it as perfect, right? Like that's what people are thinking when they're building a QA organization. They're not thinking about minimizing the number of bugs per release. They are because that's the most pressing and painful thing. It's also the most obvious. Um, but it, that's too limited. Um, so uh, when we measure quality this way, we actually get to, to measure you know, time spent on all this stuff, but we also get to add in these other things, right? Time spent in adding new features. How long does it take to build a new feature as a developer? Um, how long does it take to train a new hire? By training, I mean getting them on board uh, with enough knowledge and information about how the system works such that they don't cause havoc when they actually release code into the system, right? How do they not release, how do you, how do you get a developer up to speed enough, right? Every system, no matter how experienced you are, has a learning curve. Uh, so like, how long does it take to do this, right? If you're investing in things like pair programming or code review, like how long does it take to actually complete that? And how much, how much value are you getting out of that thing in, that, in the time frame you're allotting? These are, these are the questions that we can now apply back to our sort of relative, our actionable property of quality. And so um, uh, I want to convince you of this uh, because I think this is, a, this is a big, bold statement. So I, I, I want to give you uh, maybe a diagram to, or a couple to sort of work with to uh, make this a little bit driven home. So um, here's sort of a traditional perception of, of reducing number of bugs per release, right? A product introduces 100 bugs every release. Okay, let's install a new release process. <coughs> it's a pre-release testing process. We'll have a bunch of guys that just go through the code and go through the release and make sure everything works. And hopefully this eliminates some bugs. And let's say that as a, as a result of introducing a pre-release testing process, um, we eliminate half of those bugs. And so just for example's sake, let's just say that the cost of fixing a bug before it goes live is free, which is not actually true. But let's just assume that the cost of, the sunk cost of fixing a bug is only true when you go live. Um, then in this case, when you've pre-release tested half the bugs away and there only, are only half left, then you can say that you've halved the cost of bugs and according to our definition of quality or our, our actionable property of quality, you've doubled quality because you've sort of multiplied it by two because you've cut the number of bugs in half. Okay, so higher quality, yay. But there's another way to measure the same thing and to act on the same principles and that is, um, let's say that the time to diagnose and fix a bug is eight hours. And let's say that we decide to introduce a new debugging tool, and that reduces the time to diagnose and fix a bug to four hours on average. Okay, so now what we've done is we've halved the cost of bugs because the time spent on each bug has gone in half, and therefore we've doubled Q again. So the effect is actually, according to this actual property of quality, the same. We're actually calling these the same net output on uh, the quality of the software. By being able to to fix it faster, we're saying that we are actually making our software better. So um, I'm going to do one more example or two more examples of this just to make sure that I've convinced everybody here that this is, this is a good way to go about measuring things. Um, and it's this terrifying graph. Um, so uh, if anybody's you know, got JIRA or any sort of uh, bug tracking system, you may have seen graphs like this produced by like a QA person or a manager or somebody. And it's sort of... Uh, a terrifying thing to see, right? I mean, we're looking at this and we're going, oh my god, we can't possibly keep up with the number of bugs we're creating on our system. Like, look how, look how, look at this. Ah, this is terrifying. Okay, so the question is though, is this actually a measure of falling quality? Um, and the answer is sort of interesting. So imagine here that, you know, th these 120 real bugs that are currently open right now uh, are actually, uh, let's say, real and they're serious and they're all considered validated and every single one is distinct and unique and we've made sure that they're all real and the product team has validated them and we have to fix them. So according to our model of quality and the assumption that all bugs that need to be fixed will be fixed, we're just going to call these 120 bugs a uh, sunk cost and therefore we know we need to fix all of them. Okay, in that case, yes, this is a terrible sign of falling quality. 
right? Because if these are the number of validated, true, real bugs that are, aren't duplicates of anything that we've already seen or are serious, then yes, we have to fix these. So yeah, I would say that this is a valid uh, a following quality. However, this is not always the case, right? Realistically, if you've ever gone through the process of having a gin ginormous bug tracking tool, you'll know that very often it's, it's, it's trivially easy to have duplicated bugs, right? It's trivially easy to have duplicated bugs. Um, it's very easy to also have, like if you have like a bug filing uh, form on your website or something, it's very easy for, for people to file bugs, but they're actually not bugs, they're maybe just like questions, or they're very minor things that don't actually have any sort of relevant um, relevance to what your product is actually doing or going, or it's like, I want this to be red instead of green, and you're like, eh, I don't know, it's not really that important. I mean, like, there's not, if there's not 100% certainty about the seriousness of these, uh, or that they're even real, or that they're not just like duplicates of other bugs that we've already fixed, then you have this problem with this metric, right, or with this graph. It's not really entirely 100% guaranteed that this is a sign of falling quality. So you can't just present this to people and say, yes, things are getting terrible, things are getting so much worse right now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and call this a maybe. But now let's compare uh, this chart to this. So this is not, we've gotten, we've gotten rid of the, the, the line for open bugs. We've just, now we just have resolved. And I've added a second axis and the average time to resolution on this chart. And so you can see that in Q1, you know, we had uh, uh, six open bugs uh, and it took about an hour and a half to fix them. Uh, oh wait, didn't I read this wrong? No, no, sorry, it took about four hours to fix them, yeah. And then uh, in Q4, we're now looking at the number of bugs having gone up to, that we've actually fixed, that we've actually spent the money on, that are now up to 37, and the time it takes to debug them is eight hours. So what are we saying about Q now? Q now has, is, like, now we're saying that this, if you multiply these two together, the value has risen dramatically, and therefore, we would say that quality has Followed. So yes, this is a guaranteed 100%. You've already paid the cost. These bugs had to be fixed for a reason. So like, therefore we've spent this time. This is a sunk cost, and this is a sign of falling quality. Everybody driving with this? <coughs> so now let's talk about actually uh, selling on this concept of quality, right? So let's say we actually this is based on the same this the chart from before. We have our eight hours to resolution. And um, we decide that we wanted to add this new debugging tool in week four. And we now are saying that the quality of the software has risen because the, top, the uh, time spent on debugging has dropped in half. Okay, so the good news here is that this is an extremely compelling chart for lots of people. Not just engineers and not just QA. But for anybody that's outside of, that, of the engineering organization, you can point to this as being a quantitative and dollar-related chart of how well your organization is doing, right? You could show this. You could show this to your CEO or investors or anybody, and they can say, "Yes, now your developers are spending less time on fixing bugs and more time building features and fixing up and working on the product backlog and actually getting stuff done." So this is real value, and this is something that you can sell people on. And my point about selling this is that once, if you are in, if you are in QA, then you'll know that it's actually kind of hard sometimes to convince people about the value of spending time on quality. It's actually sometimes very difficult to do that. And so when you can point to things like this and say, quality is super related to productivity, then people are like, oh, okay. And then you can actually have investments to actually work on this sort of stuff, right? The fact that I, this new debugging tool like, makes developers more productive is a sign that maybe we should be investing more in building out quality infrastructure. If you had just been working on pre-release bugs, you know, reducing the number of bugs and testing software before it went live, you never would have gotten here, right? Because you would have only been focused on one metric, and that was reducing the number of bugs before going live. So this, is, this I think, is what QA organizations should be doing in general, is identifying inefficiencies and ways that, not necessarily that how, like, bugs that are in the system, but they should be working on a number of different things that actually make it so that developers are more empowered to fix bugs, including productivity tools, things that improve or reduce the amount of time spent on problems. So um, obviously there are some caveats on metrics, right? Uh, if you're selling something, uh, you should uh, make sure that the metric that you're using is relatively uh, easy to measure. Um, it should be something that you can measure in six months. Like if it takes a tremendous amount of infrastructure to develop a metric, it's probably not worth it. I'm just going to go ahead and say from the, from experience, um, I've tried to make really simple metrics like number of bugs open, easy, or 
crazy like ratio of commits that are still in progress that are in code review divided by the number of hours we spend and like trying to come up with wild metrics like that. Um, Okay, they could be useful, but oftentimes I've found that maintaining them or establishing a sort of like set process for measuring those just falls apart and it ends up not being worth it, especially when you don't actually know what that metric was used for, right? Same thing goes, uh, it's not in this list, but vanity metrics. I think like if you just are using vanity metrics to like convince people of quality and, and uh, stuff, then you're not going to get very far because vanity metrics don't really mean anything. Um, like, oh, we have 10,000 users now, like that means our quality needs to be higher, it doesn't really jive. Um, uh, the uh, accuracy is less important than precision point is basically about this idea that, um, okay, I'm talking about, you know, in the previous slide, you know, I'm talking about, like, time to debug software, okay? This is actually, if you, like, practically, this might actually be very hard to measure. Developers are notoriously bad, myself included, I am one, I, like, actually, I develop software on a, on a daily basis, but I and, and most developers are terrible at actually telling you how much time they're spending doing stuff. Even estimating it is also, is also atrocious, but just, just knowing how much time we're spending on it, it's like, oh, maybe it's about like two hours on that. And then it turns out after some inspection, you find out that they spent three days on it, right? After they did the research and the, back, the backlog of like investigation and all this stuff. So um, this is important, right? It's actually more important to find a way that's precise to measure rather than accurate, right? So I think, honestly, asking a developer how much time they're spending debugging software is not a great approach because you're just going to end up with crazy, wild, imprecise answers. But what if you did something that's guaranteed to always be essentially measured in roughly the same way by saying, okay, I'm going to take when the ticket in the, the, the bug filing system started progress and when it completed progress. And yes, there could be, like, uh, ideally you've automated some of these steps to make it even more precise, but most of the time a developer is good about just closing out the ticket. So if you have one single way to measure that, one single way to retrieve it, for that is, that's pretty much guaranteed to always be there, then you should end up with a more precise measure of stuff, right? I mean, again, the difference between one developer saying how much time they spend on something and like another maybe more pr like practical or pragmatic developer saying, yeah, actually, no, I spend a lot of time on this, right? They're, you're going to get wildly fluctuating answers, but if you use something that's guaranteed to be precise every time, or at least have some degree of constants, then you'll have uh, better, better selling. Uh, you'll be able to come up with this graph more easily, right? Because it'll be, I know that roughly at the time when I hit week four, it basically stuck at four hours, even if it varies slightly. Accuracy isn't as important as it, just showing that this trend happened. Does that make sense? Uh, the last thing is just that data can be used to point to anything. Uh, correlation is often confused with causation. Use them responsibly. Uh, this also ties back into the complicated metrics thing. If you make a crazy complicated metric and you do manage to make it sustainable, please at least make sure that you're not confusing people or tricking people into doing something that's actually not right. Because that's seen to happen. Um, okay, so last off, I'm not going to read through all these, but yeah, there's a ton of ways to measure rising quality according to this definition, or this actionable property of quality as being invertedly, inversely related to the uh, cost of engineering. Um, and I'm not going to read through all of them, but I mean, just my main point here is to not get stuck on this one. This is a uh, tiny fraction of the ways that you can reduce uh, our uh, time spent on things uh, and improve the quality of your system. There are a ton of other ways. I mean, even things like reducing the number of hours and meetings necessary to agree to a change to the code base. This is a real problem. This is a real thing. This really sucks away at the time of your organization. Think about all the things you could be doing when you're arguing about how something works or even just trying to understand how it works because you need to actually meet with the original engineer to understand the code. That's, yeah, silly. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm sure there's probably a lot of questions about all this whole section, and I'm happy to spend time on it at the end. Um, but what I'd like to talk about now, actually, is the next point, which is, uh, what actually is a culture of quality? So, um, a culture of quality, it, when I actually started working on this presentation, I realized it was actually very hard to come up with sort of a concrete way to describe this, right? I, I don't know if I can, I didn't actually come up with a mathematical notation for, for this as I did with the actual definition of quality, but um, uh, it, I can tell you sort of like generally things about a, qual a culture of quality that actually work really well that I know are pretty consistent. So um, it's like, uh, so what Justice Potter Stewart said, you know, I know it when I see it, right? I mean, we're not talking about like pornographic film here, we're talking about quality, but the concept is the same, right? When I like see a culture of quality, I know it, I just see it. It's like, it passes the elephant test, right? Which is hard to describe, recognizable instantly, right? Um, I uh, know that when I see, like, and, and so basically I'm just going to go through a couple of attributes that I've seen in cultures of quality that uh, generally result in things getting better over time. Um, optimism, all kinds of good stuff. 
So, uh, number one, the most important thing by far, no question, is that there is lots of trust and there's open communication. Uh, and so this is because very often you have in a, in, in, a, in a growing company, you end up where the lead developer is has been working his heart out on something for the last two years, new developer comes in and says, this is stupid. This is like the worst written code I've ever seen. How could you do it this way, you stupid idiot, right? And the, uh, the, that, like, the, like, that jarring effect of, like, like, of new people and old people and like, how things could be working or should be working and like, politics creep up, you don't want this. This needs to be wiped away immediately. The culture at your company needs to be about trust. You need to be able to you know, argue viscerally all day long and go home like, loving each other. There needs to be a way of, you need to be able to openly communicate your problems without having insecurities and, and issues and be worried about how somebody will respond to it um, uh, to the extent that, you, that they may like, threaten to resign or something. Or threaten to fire you. I mean, you don't want those to be problems. There should be no fear. You should be able to like express your thoughts openly. Um, so this is a little bit more technical, um, and this is sort of related to open communication. And it may not be obvious immediately, but I'll tell you why. Um, vertically slicing engineers comes from agile, and it's this idea that uh, you shouldn't really have like an engineer whose only job it is to make like the website look really good, and then another engineer who does backend optimizations, and another engineer who does technical operations and installs soft install servers, and another engineer just dedicated to quality assurance, and another one dedicated to just security, and another one dedicated to just performance. Um, that you should instead be able to divide your engineering organization uh, into uh, groups that essentially can complete an ex exactly one unit of sort of functional work. Uh, that a consumer could, a customer could theoretically use, right? Like in pra in practice, they may not be true all the time. Um, but the idea being that if you can do that, you can if you can split according to just saying uh, this engineer is capable of producing an entire feature. If you can do that, that means that that's, it's easier to demo that. It's easier to like sort of get insights into how well you're doing. Um, it also means that an engineer sort of knows more, and that engineer is also interchangeable with any other engineer. There's actually also a bus factor issues there. Um, and so yeah, uh, instead of having all those guys, instead you may just have people called software engineers, or maybe you have something fancy called you know DevOps engineers or whatever. And this is this idea that I guess operations hasn't always embraced. Uh, I'm probably butchering this, but developers or operations hasn't always embraced like complicated software systems as a way to sort of simplify uh, maintenance and how you automate uh, configurations and stuff like that. I think this is sort of a new, relatively new philosophy for operations. But um, we can do questions at the end. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, you know the, the thing about this is actually that's actually I think very valuable is um, it's not necessarily that you have functional groups. What actually happens in organizations that are vertically sliced is you have greater empathy. It's actually a very subtle change. But what happens is that if I go to a, a, an organization that's very horizontally sliced, where you have people that are just tech ops or you have just front end engineers, when you ask them, you know, the site's not performing very well. Like it's really slow when I go to the site. Oh, it's not my problem. It's not my problem. I just don't deal with that. I'm not a performance engineer. I can't really help you with that. And that sucks. That's like that. That just means there's the, the communication is not the, the like the number of hoops you have to jump over in order to get to somebody that can actually help fix your problem is way higher than it should need to be, right? Or that even the person that could tell you how to get to that person is very far away. Like just talking to a front end engineer. I mean, what if I have to solve a like server issue? I don't, he's probably not going to know because maybe even, I mean, the back end person might know how to talk to that person, but the front end engineer probably only talks to the back end engineer who's providing services. So, yeah, you have big communication gaps. It's hard to get think, places. It's actually, I think, this actually is a big problem in organizations uh, that don't have really high uh, sort of uh, slopes for their quality. So, um, this I've seen is, is a quality that does not. Um, this is not to be understated. This is this is super true. This is 100% accurate. I have generally found that nerds are the ones who are going to challenge the status quo the most. They think about more. They consider alternatives. They generally care more about how things are structured. And most of the time, uh, you know, they express their thoughts. What well, I mean, they are thoughtful. Um, a nerd can be compelled with logic and not with emotion. I think this is actually so fundamentally true um, because. Uh, and so important because if you have a, an organization based on entirely on pathos, you're not going to make a lot of logical choices. Um, so uh, you know, I think generally nerds are also more willing to uh, stay late, think about uh, stay late in the like philosophical sense, right? Like they're willing to think about issues, they're willing to take it home with them, to be thinking about it all the time because it's an intellectual curiosity to fix some of these problems, right? It's not just a, a pay and go job. I'm not I'm not cashing out at five and leaving and just not thinking about it anymore. I mean. Um, 
this, this is actually exactly how Google has built their sort of great culture of quality, is by having an extraordinarily nerdy culture. They just constantly are thinking about better ways to do stuff. Um, and so Box really aspires to be like this. Um, experimentation is super insanely encouraged, um, especially when you can come back and uh, with the results, like in our, in our whole metric section, if you can come back with the results from an experimentation and show that it's helped, I mean, that should be encouraged. And uh, the good news here is that actually I think even in organizations where experimentation is not really uh, perceived as a great idea, I think, it's actually, I think it's actually easier to tell somebody that I would like to try a very small experiment and like, give you like measurable outcome and then just trash it if it didn't go well, uh, or like, continue with it if it does go well. I think it, but you can start off like a small experiment and build a culture that then starts to value experiments more and more. I mean, this is just the scientific method, right? Like, you can try something, make something better, um, and that overall means that you are able to make little initiatives and changes that will work over time. And this has been true at Box too, right? Like we have, we have experiments going on all the time. Some of our experiments are total disasters, and some of them are great, and we are like relying on we rely on them. And I'll actually go into some of the experiments that have become uh, very good for us uh, in a little bit. Um, but yeah, if you can't, if there's a fear of experimentation, if there's like a, a fear that things are going to go wrong if I try something new, like that's or or even that if the thought hasn't crossed your mind to maybe just like take a little sliver of work and just try something slightly different. I mean, if you're not doing that, then you're missing out on like evolution's great promise, which is that you can like iteratively make changes over time and eventually get better, right? This is, this is a very important thing. Um, and this is, this is probably one of my favorite things that I've, that I've noticed in a culture of quality. It's that um, everybody in a culture of quality tends to be self-actualized. And what do I mean by that exactly? This is a very fluffy term. Um, well, uh, I actually mean self-actualized in the context of uh, needs met along Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if you're not familiar with this, this is a really cool concept. It's basically this idea that um, humans have some sort of fundamental needs that they have to have met, and once these are met, they can start worrying about these, and so on and so on. So, um, for example, if you are not able to uh, breathe right now, you might not be so concerned with uh, creativity or, or spontaneity or even morality. You might be like, I actually really need to breathe, guys. Um, so, uh, this is actually very, very relevant, I've found, in a culture of quality. In a company that actually had, that respects their employees, that gives them confidence and gives them a platform for achievement, like if we do demos, like demos for people's <coughs> products, and then and like we, do, we show the demos to every engineer, and that, that like creates self-esteem and confidence and the respect of others. Um, and what we've done is, in exchange for giving these things, we get all these. This is great. These are the things that you want in engineers. Even in engineers that may not be as strong, is uh, as some of your high, super high performers, you still get people that are thinking creatively. They're at least um, trying to be problem solvers instead of being dead weight. This is a big deal. Um, uh, this last one here, acceptance of facts. This is so hilarious that it's such a, that, it, that it's actually a big enough problem. But sometimes when people are stubborn or not thinking, or like if they're not even getting the esteem aspects of stuff, they may just be willing to write off facts just because it's of personal problems. This is and this always results in chaos. So. It's very important to have these things. I mean, the, the ways that we implement this are really obvious, right? Like, don't talk over each other, right? Don't interrupt each other. Talk in a low voice. Like, say thank you. Stupid shit like that. But like, sorry. But like, that's it's that important to just have a uh, clear and open communication platform that you can just sort of and, and like a, a, a company that builds confidence, and you will get some of these great attributes. Um, and just as a sidebar, you know, or a side note, if you're not, if you don't have some of these things, right? If your uh, if your company does not necessarily, you know, encourage sleeping, or uh, decides to change the way that you work on a regular basis, or uh, maybe even doesn't seem to do things morally, like if you've been reading that kick sign in the news lately, uh, then it's very unlikely that you will uh, even be considering how to build great software. Very unlikely. Um, last two points are that, you know, one is that in a, in a culture of quality, developers ask, you know, what does it mean to test this? What does it mean for this software to work, right? And that just influences how they're building the software, right? This is uh, what happens when a company has developers that care about software and care about their software working well and not just about churning out products. Um, I think this is a big deal. Um, and then on the inverse, we say that QA asks, you know, how can I make developers more effective? What can I do to make a developer a more effective uh, uh, person? Because I can't just expect them to test every single thing. I can't just like treat them as though they're like idiots and they don't care about quality. They probably do, but they just don't know. Maybe they just don't have enough scope or context, or like, can I give them a better tool to do it? This is if this is about understanding. This is about, this is really all about empathy. Um, so uh, yeah. 
I know these are all kind of fluffy um, and maybe not necessarily things that you can immediately see how to like translate to your company, but I mean, uh, let me just give you some context of some of the effects this has had at Box. And not just at Box, I mean, lots of these things we stole from other companies, um, or not necessarily stole, but we've adapted to Box so that meet, they meet the requirements of our culture and our needs. Um, but I mean, the, the, these, the things that I'm about to show you are, one, totally related to our new, our new actionable property of quality, because they all are about reducing the amount of time or about increasing productivity, and they're all about, um, and they're, and they're also all about meeting some of the, the requirements that we have uh, in the culture of quality, or the, taking advantage of, rather, of some of the attributes in our culture of quality. So first of all, just a really uh, really simple thing that happens once we start realizing uh, some of these things is that, uh, you know, we have three groups at Box. We had our quality assurance group. These were just our central quality assurance engineers. These are responsible for the release, uh, or rather the quality of the release. And then we actually had a release team that specifically is in charge of just, you know, SCPA the code out, right? Um, we don't do that anymore. Um, and uh, the third thing is uh, our tools and frameworks team. And these guys are sort of roughly trying to build tools that people use, but you know, like they were sort of disconnected from like the the day to day work that QA and release went through. Um, so we did something really simple. We just said this is now all of engineering services. This has one director. This is one. There's one person in charge of sort of deciding how uh, this group should work in, as a whole. And so it lets us do things like saying we're going to build all the things that we build are going to be about striving towards continuous deployment. Continuous deployment is sort of a dreamy end state, kind of like 100% code coverage. You can never get there, but it's sort of lovely to be on the way there. Um, this idea is that uh, you know I can create a metric about the quality assurance group and how they're doing, and then I can tie that back to how well our tool and frame, tools and frameworks do, group is producing tools for our for our engineers. This is actually a, this is such a simple process thing, but it's actually very helpful because it means that you can actually coordinate these groups because what they do is all it totally related. It's all totally related. Um, so here's, here's a principle that we have that we take very seriously, and that is that automated testing is so much better than manual testing. Um, and so here's one of our products, uh, and so I'll sort of explain this. This chart's a little complicated, but we have, uh, you know, we have uh, this cumulative graph here of the types of like types of test cases they're doing and the sort of sum number of test cases that we're running. Um, the orange is uh, are the number of manual test cases that we're running, um, and the white is the sort of uh, Automated number of automated test cases that we're running, and the triangles are, are, are measured on the other axis, and that's the number of hours it takes to execute each suite. And so you can see here, we started off in this product with 450 manual test cases, and it took approximately 34 uh, hours to run all through all of them. So over like a couple days, like we have like the suite of manual testers that are just like churning through these things. Um, and uh, you can see over time, what we started doing is we introduced these automated testing tools. And uh, we uh, started encouraging developers to stop writing these test cases in English for manual testers and instead just start writing automated test cases. And what started happening was we, we realized these were able to grow much faster. Um, and also, that here you can see sort of an interesting thing we did. We started replacing our manual test cases with automated ones. Um, and so we actually totally exploded the number of test cases that we were able to run, but also we reduced the total number of uh, uh, the amount of time it took to actually execute them. Uh, see, this is this is just like logic, right? But like, I mean, this is, but this is so important because w one thing that we realized we're able to test quickly our feedback cycle for how like does my software work, right? Like, it's not 32 hours anymore. It's it's something like it's actually way less than this now. I mean, like, I think we're down to like eight minutes for our entire suite, and we have way more test cases than this. Way more test cases than this. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're able to produce, uh, uh, and also none of these numbers are real, by the way. This is all. But, um, I mean, it's not made up, but this is uh, only a representation. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the other part of this is that automated test cases drive quality into the developer's heads, as opposed to just saying like, oh yeah, this should work, and then like they sort of leave it aside, right? It's, uh, we actually have changed uh, the manual QA process entirely, so that I don't think we really even incur manual test cases anymore. Uh, one other thing just about automated test cases is that uh, when we say automated, we actually mean fast automated. There's actually uh, Selenium browser-based test cases. If you're familiar with Selenium, it's essentially a browser emulator, and um, you, uh, that is those test cases tend to not actually be very quick. And so we actually encourage, to the extent possible, lots of unit tests and lots of integration tests instead. Those are orders of magnitude quicker um, and can get you just the same level of quality, maybe with like a few gaps in sort of the end-to-end, -end, but that's can be, those can be verified relatively easily manually. Plus, you can get way more comprehensive test results if you perform at the integration unit. So we really strongly encourage fast unit tests. Um, okay, so here's a concept that we have. Uh, code ownership is this idea that um, 
to specific developers that are responsible for specific files. And so this is something that uh, we implemented, Google has it. Um, the idea is that uh, there's actually a file located somewhere, or maybe files, depending on how you've done it, um, that indicate which developers own which files. This, that, this idea is that uh, you know, each developer is responsible for ensuring the quality and maintainability of that file. If they have uh, you know, too much to own in a particular file, they should split it up, or they should figure out a way to uh, you know, share the responsibility. Um, and then you know, when an error comes in from a file on production, we'll actually report that error directly to the person that owns that file. So we take the stack trace and we map the, the line number in the, in the file directly to the developer that owns that file. So it gets us a faster turnaround time on like, people being able to find and, and resolve bugs because we were, taking, we're sending the error directly to the person that could probably answer why it's causing the failure. Um, it also means that uh, the other thing that's really nice about this is that uh, you know, we are semi-automating our bus factor accretion, as in the number of people that need to be hit by a bus in order for our company to sink into the ocean actually rises as a result of forcing people to share responsibility of code. So this is actually, this is actually working out pretty well. Um, there are definitely some caveats here, right? Like if you, have a, if you have a big legacy file and then you assign one person to own it, that's going to be hairy, so you have to figure out ways to sort of like manage and share responsibility. But on a per file basis, this works for like 80% of your code base, um, assuming that 20% is normally. So here's an example of our uh, PHP DSL. I'm sorry, I missed. So let's say I own this file, and there are 10 people who want to do changes. What happens? So but can we actually save questions for the end, just so that we have uh, one big QA session around it? I think it's, it's important, but it's an important question. Yeah. Um, so I just, want, I just want to quickly touch on our DSL for, uh, for, for code ownership. This is PHP, for the record. We do a lot of work to make sure that PHP is as versatile as any other language. I think PHP gets a lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, crap for being possibly a less sophisticated language, but we spend a lot of time and energy making sure that PHP can give us the level of quality and sophistication that we want. So just roughly speaking here, what we've done here is we've, we've, we've created groups of people um, aliased by uh, sort of what they're responsible for. So we have Ben and Sam and Florian, they're all in the sort of architects group. Uh, and then we have our uh, Fastbox team, which are performance sort of focused engineers. Um, and then in, our, in the root of our repository, we actually have this owner's declaration. We say that the architects own everything by default, but then, um, and the, the first developers own sort of everything by default, but they're responsible for pushing down the responsibility of changes, right? Uh, so if I, so like for example, I own the test directory. So the architects don't necessarily own that anymore because I'm better suited to answer questions about things that go on in the test directory, and so forth. Um, so uh, this uh, is uh, also good at reducing the amount of time it takes to find who owns a file. We actually also have a command line tool that just lets us say, okay, who owns this file, and it just tells you. Um, which is really convenient. It makes it easy for somebody to say, who's just started, to say, I have no idea what I'm working on, who should I talk to? This, this actually is really, really powerful. Um, okay, so uh, the, uh, so stop the line is, uh, if you're familiar with continuous integration, um, it's just the simple idea that when you push a new change to your, to your code base, that you should just run all of your automated tests on that change. And that gets you some sense of like how, you know, whether or not you've introduced a new regression as fast as possible. Um, so we've taken this one step further and we say stop the line. And that means that if the CI suite of automated test cases fails, we actually don't let anybody else push. Mind, we have, we have over 120 engineers, just for context, right? We actually say nobody else can push if our continuous integration suite fails. And so what happens is we, nobody can push any changes until somebody that actually tags the build as, as having fixed the build, and they're the only person allowed to push. Um, and we enforce this with Git, actually. Git has great uh, hooks that you can uh, build into. I would highly recommend automating um, if you use Git. Um, I think you can also do this with Subversion to a certain extent. I'm not totally sure. Um, but I mean, if you can, I would totally recommend automating your tools uh, and Git because this allows you to do allows us to do a ton of things. Um, but yeah, so we don't let anybody push until the continuous integration build is fixed. And so some of the benefits of this are that you know um, uh, there's no confusion about who caused the problem, right? It's only one person. There's no time when two people could collide on the same work, um, and uh, you know just generally reduces the amount of time it takes to debug uh, because again, there's not many changes that could possibly happen in one commit versus in like. 10 or 100 or the entire week's worth uh, when you're integrating all at the end. So this, this is actually a very powerful concept. And just for context, you know, if you try and do git push uh, and the stop line is in effect, you get like a spaghetti monster like ASCII art thing that dumps out on the screen. So it's not like 
in, in this way, we try not to make it accusatory, but more playful. Um, uh, it's a little bit silly, but yeah, it is, it's cool. Okay. Um, so, but we actually did get fed up, uh, or this is sort of, we have a set of one and reverse. This, this came first before stop the line. But this actually helps with speeding up stop the line. It's this idea that uh, we have a crazy service called Soul Crusher, um, which the concept here is that when you're, we, we actually have mandatory code reviews at Box. You have, you, you have to get a code review um, from a certain number of people in order for your code to actually be submitted into our repository. Um, and at the time when you're doing code review, chances are you're most of the way done with your feature. You may just be seeking some basic architectural questions. Maybe you just want to get uh, like a quick check. Chances are you're not more than a few hours away from submitting. So at this point, it's very convenient if we can just run CI on this code now, as opposed to waiting until right before we push, and then you run tests, and then you realize it's broken, and then you need to push it back to code review to make sure that that change that you made because of tests is working uh, for the person that reviewed it. So yeah, we just want to speed this up. This was this is another time-based thing, but we want to say in order to make this faster, let's just make it so that we have this extra user named Soul Crusher who downloads your review if you don't pass continuous integration. You're not actually merged to trunk yet. You're just getting context for if you pushed right now, this is what would happen. So this is a very nice tool that we have. Um, it makes it fast for people to get feedback on the work that they've done. It just speeds up the loop. This, this is really what we care about, speeding up the loop. Um, so uh, this is another fun one. Um, it's called Performance on the Pot. Um, this is a direct clone of Google's uh, testing on the toilet. And this is, idea is that we actually um, We'll come up with little snippets of useful information, like how do you do a git bisect, or um, you know how do I get help on a feature I'm working on, uh, and we actually will take do a one page printout and we'll paste them over all the toilets on the second floor, and um, if it just takes advantage of these sort of extra cycles where people aren't thinking about stuff, you know, while they're thinking about the uh, the porcelain god there, they can also be considering how to make their code better. This is so subtle, but it's and it seems so silly, but it's actually great because people love it, and people love spending time thinking about these things, and also suggest new things to put up here all the time. I think this is one of the best developments at Box in a long time. <laughs> um, so yeah, anyway, it's cool. Um, so. Uh, Lastly, uh, one of the things that's happened at Box, and this has sort of fueled a lot of the other stuff, is that uh, we have a group called Quality Education, and it's a, it's a cross-functional group. It's sort of a weekly think tank of our like, software developers and test bestets and regular engineers. And the idea here is that um, we, are tr we create a regular ongoing forum for creating for questions that, that a regular engineer may have, that a, a, a quality assurance engineer may have, or vice versa. Um, very often, it's the case that if you have a separate quality assurance group and regular group, engineering group, you're going to end up in a situation where people don't quite know what they each other want. And we have a, so we have this regular session ongoing that gets us sort of constant feedback on how we're doing and what we can do better. Um, this has been invaluable to our engineering services group. Um, questions like why is this slow? Why are tests slow? Why is this taking a long time? Code review takes way too long. I, I should be getting feedback way faster than this, right? Okay, well, what if we install a Jabber bot that IMs you when your code review is done? Cool, right? Like this is the kind of those kind of conversations. Like you think they're easy, but then they never happen because there's those two people never end up in the same room to talk about it. So the format for college, just to uh, quickly go over this, is just that you know um, the day of we send around a quick agenda for what we want to actually uh, talk about. Um, discussions are fast. They're action oriented. They're about getting things done. Uh, we have sort of an informal backlog of what we want to get done. Uh, actions are sort of taken on by both engineers and quality insurance engineers and whoever else may be there. I mean, if Sam, the, the, the VP of technology, comes in and we're like, Sam, we need you to do this, we'd be like, okay. Like, this is a group of, that is extraordinarily cross-functional. The goal is to basically be flexible in a world where you need to have incremental progress. I mean, fundamentally, I think and this is one, one of the biggest overriding philosophies at Box is that there's no pure, 100% perfect software. It does not exist. There's also no such thing as what we're doing today is good enough. There's, neither of those things are true. So we should have some kind of systematic way to constantly be improving things over time. That way, we that way we're always thinking about how to do things better. Nobody is sensitive. Excuse me. Nobody is sensitive to how we're doing things now, um, changing versus experimenting with something that could be better. I mean, this is how things like performance on the pot even got started, right? We realized this might be fun. We did it. Oh my God, this is super cool. People are loving it. Let's keep doing it. This is this is exactly how this happens. And ordinarily, it would never win. So this has been very good. Um, yeah, so uh, that's that's it for what sort of like the, uh, what I've perceived as a, like a culture or quality is and how it's sort of manifested a box. 
Um, I want to quickly do uh, the next five minutes just sort of like how to build one, uh, and then plus t like time for questions, because I think this is a sort of complicated topic, and I want to get people's feedback also to answer a couple of questions that come up. Um, but uh, so uh, quickly, um, this is how I perceive traditional quality assurance groups, and this is this is the first and most painful and most important step to getting towards a culture that actually promotes high quality, um, and that is moving away from this model. In this model, you have engineers that say, okay, I'm done, can you like test my code, thanks, and then they send it over to quality assurance, and quality assurance either you know, sends it back if it doesn't work, or they say, okay, it's good, and then uh, they say, here you go, to the customers, they sort of funnel it through the release process, and boom, there is tons of bugs, there's lots of issues, and you end up with a slow feedback cycle, and all it took was uh, a five-day QA cycle. Um, yeah, that's not really acceptable, and it doesn't, and this is a lot of big things, right? Um, I mean, first off, manual testing is, it, the, the problem with the quality assurance group is generally the testing is all manual or it's black box sort of driven, automated, so like Selenium. Um, these are both slow and they don't reinforce sort of, sort of a subtle problem that black box QA testing doesn't address, which is software quality itself, the actual quality of the code being written isn't determined by how well these tests pass. You actually need unit tests and integration tests to go into the call at the code level to see whether or not code is like, actually being maintained well. Um, so, and they're also slow, like I said before. We, we need fast test cases in order to have a fast feedback cycle. So, black box, this, this, this style does not work well. Um, and also, just, you know, the other thing is that it's, it limits the quality, uh, the definition of quality to just number of bugs per release. Again, super limiting. This is not enough to show whether or not we're actually improving the quality of software. Again, it's not what people are, are thinking of when they're starting a quality assurance organization. They're trying to think about how do we make our software, like, amazing. And this is not what it's going to achieve at so just as a first step to uh, getting away from this, uh, and this is this is probably the most hand wavy slide in my entire presentation, so just forward, forward warning here. Um, this is where you're going to need all the things about the culture that I sort of talked about, right? You need you need a culture where you can actually encourage, you can actually experiment, where you can actually make a change that could be risky, but you are willing to measure it and see how well it works and how to improve it over time. You need uh, trust. You need open communication. You need to be able to communicate with your uh, the, the, the VP of engineering or maybe even the CEO that you're going to do this because this could have real repercussions in this initial phase, and it totally does because it's it's it could be jarring, but it's important to have all these things in place. Um, and yeah, again, metrics, metrics about time, metrics about the like quality of your software that need to be rock solid before you can start doing this. So. Um, to get away from traditional QA, the first thing that needs to happen is you're going to get this, right? Okay, please test it, and you're going to be like, uh, no. So, uh, the goal here is, and this happened to Box, we moved away from saying we have a central quality assurance group that is in charge of establishing whether or not your code works. We stopped doing that. We just said, here, we're going to do something called exploratory testing. We're just basically going to rough out the product. We're going to see whether or not you basic, whether or not things have broken in a very general sense. The the things that if the if they were broken, the business would end kind of thing. That's what they check, check. But they don't take like a list of test cases that you can then you know offer and have them test for you. This is not how this works. Instead, what we'll do, we'll give you a suite of automated test tools that will help you figure out whether or not your code works well. And you're responsible. Responsibility falls on the developer. This is huge. This is a big change. Developers are going to say things like, we don't have time, the product team is crazy, we like, can't do this, right? And you need to get buy-in, you need to get top-down buy-in. You need to have somebody from the top who can say, this is okay, this is worth doing. Spending, spending uh, Transitioning this to this style of quality, where you have an automated, continuously deploying-ish, like, continuously deploying uh, software suite, is fundamental um, uh, to getting the stuff done. Yeah, and the, and the thing that's implicit about this is that you still end up, you actually end up in a, with a pipeline where developers uh, eventually have very few barriers to just getting stuff out. <laughs> this seems scary, but if you think about it, if we've done, if we do, if we do more automated testing than we did manual testing, remember that graph where we showed that the like, number of automated test cases is so much higher than the number of manual ones, it takes way less time, and that 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 growth of automated test cases is super high. You can basically guarantee that going through continuous integration and running through that, plus maybe some spot checking when you're just developing your code, is all the QA you're ever going to get before you go live. So there's really no harm in just saying, you know what, we have all the tools in place to make sure there are no regressions in an automated way. It's pretty much 
as safe as it's ever going to get just to push live. There are other things that you can do once you're on live to maybe then mitigate the damage, like through resilience measures or something like that. There are other, there's a whole like other topic that we can talk about with like feature flipping and canary releases and things like that, but we won't get to that uh, since we're basically out of time. Um, so, but yeah, of course, you're still going to end up with problems on live, and this is just to be expected. You have to be able to acknowledge that this is going to happen, and you have to be able to show, though, that in, in the new way of doing things, that you can actually reduce the pains of what's going live. Um, and that can be by reducing, just reducing the amount of time it takes to fix bugs. Re actually reducing the number of bugs before they go live is also obviously very important. We should be doing that. Um, but uh, the whole point here, though, is to be measurable and not emotional. Right? It's, about to actu it's about actually having real concrete things you can show the CEO, and he can be like, okay, I can see how things are improving. This is what you want. Um, so yeah, again, this is good because it puts quality into the developer's head. Uh, and it frees the QA group, and this is the other thing, it frees the QA group to do higher leverage things, like forming a quality education group, uh, or forming just engineering services, or doing performance in the pot, or doing, like, like better, making a better continuous integration tool. I mean, Soul Crusher doesn't come out of the box, right? Who, who would name a product Soul Crusher? <laughs> you wouldn't sell that. Um, so, like, we made that, and that was because we have, were free to build it, and that is actually really important. Um, so, okay. Uh, so just some general recommendations, uh, and then I'll take questions. But the general recommendation here is, you know, you need to find metrics, big wins, that in the beginning can show that you can reduce time costs to your engineering organization. Um, you need to sort of get people bought, bought in on this idea that quality doesn't necessarily have to be just about the number of bugs that get released uh, in one release, but maybe also <laughs> just be uh, the amount of time we're spending on stuff. Um, you need to promote a culture that encourages experimentation and openness and, and nerdiness and have demos and, like, basically take like embrace the idea that your code can be sort of amazing and that the developers that you work with are amazing. Um, and then, uh, I mean, this doesn't, uh, parentheses, you should always be hiring really, really strong people. Don't ever hire mediocre people. A, a people hire A people, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and be constantly challenging the status quo to do things better, right? You should always be thinking about how you can do stuff better. There's no such thing as perfect software. There's no such thing as good enough software, in my opinion. So, um, yeah, those are my general recommendations. And, uh, you know, every organization is different. But I think the same general principles will apply everywhere. But um, I'm totally happy to take questions now and uh, talk about maybe specific things that you may be thinking about. So. Um, and one of the, the things that I found was that I felt like the developers needed more training in terms of thinking like, uh, like robust testing. Um, so there's one thing is the developers actually need training in QA. And the second thing is, one of the criticisms I had is we did not have the proper infrastructure for the developers to actually do testing properly. So their sandboxes were not enough light production, mm -hmm. for example. So, so those are two things, yeah. infrastructure and training as and that those critical are, thinking skills. Yeah, those are both good points. Um, so on to the first point, um, quality education was formed <laughs> primarily as a way to educate people about how to do things the right way and how to train people. The goal was actually engineers don't know enough about some of the tools that we built, right? Like we will we'll like we'll build like a really good we'll build some sandbox thing, right? That people may or may not know how to use, and then it's only until quality education where we're actually talking to engineers and they're like, oh wait, there's a thing like that, and you're like, yes, you should use it. And actually, half the battle is just getting people to know what tools they have available. Um, even if so, then if they do know everything that they have, and I, the second question I'd, be, I'd have is, you know, are your engineers doing unit testing? There's yeah. all yeah, right. So like. Um, if, if you don't, if you have unit testing, it's uh, depending on your platform. I would imagine that there's a relatively straightforward path towards getting continuous integration, um, and from there, there is a path towards like having a more continuous deployment focused thing. But the main thing is training. Yes, training is a fear, right? It's a fear that developers just don't know enough. But it's but it's a fixed it's a fixed cost problem. It's something that it's overcomable versus the cost of having ongoing, never improving quality is, is super painful. Um, so this. Again, I think it all ties back to having some measurable show for like how things could be better, showing how much time and then money could actually be like spent like on maybe just this initial cost, but then over time the improvement is like exponential. That would be that would be the sort of ideal outcome. Um, I'm happy. Maybe we should talk about this afterwards. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, code ownership that people should own the code or some piece of code, but then you before you said you have that uh, vertical structure. Yeah. But basically. 
Doesn't code ownership then promote, oh, this is not my code, you have to talk to this other guy that's yeah. right now? So uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that only, so vertical slicing doesn't have to be incompatible, although, yeah, I can see that this, how that would work. Um, imagine, uh, so, and it does come up that, you know, I, let's say I own a piece of the framework, right? Like I own our database layer. Right? And the code responsible for accessing the database layer. Okay, yes, I have a horizontal cut there. It is my responsibility and nobody else's, and you can't really have vertical slices through our database for a layer. But for features, for feature things, right? Like on, on, on Box, it's like I want to be able to like files. You can now like files on Box. So um, the person that owns the liking of files, that's like specific code that like goes all the way down the stack from the top, right? From the view layer all the way down to the database access layer. Not at the framework level, but at the, you know, at the point where they're actually building the feature. Um, so, and that's the, that's the vertical slice there, right? That person, that engineer is familiar with all the components that they went that went into building that feature, and, and they can talk to any other engineer about them, and they wouldn't understand them. So, it's very difficult to, to have a pure vertical slice, but to the extent possible, having just that sort of like empathetic atmosphere, it's like everybody kind of knows how things work, and everything's sort of understood, that, that helps a lot. That's my name. Uh, did you have a situation that quality was actually dangerous for business? Quality issues were dangerous for business. And if you realize this SQA person, you can do two things. You can kind of try to talk to top management, explain things, and explain them that things should be changed, and usually you're going to be rejected. Or you can wait till major blow up and then come with your suggestions. Yeah. What did you do? So it's a great point, and I mean, um, if anything, I would just, my, my, I think one salient point I want everybody to take away from this is that people at that high level can be compelled with some of these metrics, because I, because all these tie back to dollars, right? We haven't even talked about, we didn't even address once the cost to our customer base, right, as a result, as a result of quality problems, right? We didn't even, we didn't even bring that up. But what we did bring up was the cost to engineering, right? It is tremendously inefficient to have a crappy quality assurance infrastructure. So to start, I mean, yeah, you're always, yes, you will, you will run into, into, into pushback on these sorts of issues, but numbers speak louder than words. You know, what measure, gets measured gets done, so they say, right? Um, if you can come up with like graphs like this where it's like, well, if we just added this debugging tool, or if we had a code review system, or if we had continuous integration properly, where people are spending time on unit testing, we could make productivity soar, and like we could actually build things faster, and that would save us money over time. And people will respond to that. Um, I worked at a company uh, where, um, so Aaron is, like I said, Aaron's a very product-focused engineer, so, or, or CEO, so he has uh, a lot of like really good intuitions on like, okay, yeah, we should be fixing bugs, maybe that's important. Um, but I worked at a company where the where the, the CEO was actually sort of a CFO, and his response to the, the product has bugs was, well, it's not worth it to us to fix it. And it took a, a very concerted effort along the lines of essentially showing how it was too expensive to have poorly functioning software um, for it to be tenable to continue to do it the way we were doing it. I had to argue a completely different way for quality to actually take place. At Box, it's actually really easy, right? Because, again, if you have a product-focused CEO, he'll be like, yes, I clearly want the software to work well. But if, if you have a CMO, CFO type CEO, you're not going to get that same sort of response when you suggest the quality should be better. You're going to have to prove it with numbers, essentially. Sometimes it does take a big blow up, too. But the big blow up needs to be treated with, uh, have you ever taken, uh, I don't know if you have postmortems or sort of retrospectives at your company, but those are often the best venues to suggest big experiment, like experimental changes or, or changes that would improve things over time. You have to, those are those are actually really important from learning from, uh, to learn from, and they do sometimes are they're sometimes necessary for it. But in this context, it's always about being not not being emotional, not being like blaming, not not taking it as a personal problem of the engineers that they screwed up everything. It has to be about blameless and postmortems. That's actually a whole other presentation. Um, yeah. Uh, can you give a couple ideas of metrics? So we know number of bugs, we know uh, cost of maintain maintenance of the code. What else can it be? Um, there's uh, so a couple of metrics. Uh, don't, let me pull up that slide again. Uh, <coughs> this guy. Um, this is on the site, so you can you can take a reference to this. But essentially, anything that met, that shows that developers are spending more time than they need to on something, you can pull from this. Um, anything that shows that there's like an, anything that could possibly indicate that there are inefficiencies in the system, right? I still think the meetings one is huge, right? Like it, the, the, 
meeting meeting meetings are breed more meetings and they just consume time and like most of the time meetings are stupid. Like I think that oftentimes with this time that we spend in meetings, we could spend half that time if we just had like a proper documentation system in place. Um, or even they also another really important thing about unit testing is it's one of the best forms of documentation you can possibly have because it's always up to date. Um, if your tests fail, it means that the, the assumptions of the code have changed and therefore you can use that as documentation. Anyway, the point is that there's lots of ways to indicate how you're being inefficient. You can pull metrics on any of these and I'm sure that you could use them and tie them back to the quality infrastructure. Yep. Uh, I, we wanted to change the infrastructure as the engineering department and we were told, oh no, because it's not cost effective. Well, we did know it was cost effective based on this. So what I did was first write up the rules that were kind of not, under, not understood. And then I went and wrote a business plan to present to the management, not the engineers. We were all in agreement. And it was to show that, hey, if we change the infrastructure, we could tier it, they could charge more for this. And it's just, it's just changing how we're doing it so that they could ch charge at different levels. Also, how you could change these rules so that it was more consistent to the uh, user, because we're getting some complaints from the user community. Voila, they wanted to have that infrastructure change, yeah. and that infrastructure change included bug fixes and automated testing and a whole bunch of other things for quality, but we had to make a business case, not an engineering case. Yep. Can you talk about how this, how everything you're talking about also supports um, for you guys things like, uh, you know, product roadmap and user experience and some of those things beyond just purely unit testing? And yeah, well, for sure. I mean, the, the, the good thing about this system too is it makes, um, honestly, I think that a system that is efficiently run, just in terms of its engineering specific stuff, um, results in a, in, a, in a world that's actually easier to predict product changes in. Generally speaking, I think if you know that you have a certain amount of certainty about how things work and that you're not afraid to make change because you have no, let's say you have no regression detection at all, you might be terrified of what the system would do if you made even the slightest change. Systems like this make it make developers more confident, which is another, which is just another one of these like hard to measure but actually very important things. Is is like if you actually have regression protection, if you actually can say that my system will work better as a result of investing in this infrastructure, I can guarantee, I can sort of give you more, uh, maybe consistent uh, predictions about how long it will take to get stuff done. I like what you said also about the, the nerd focus, but, but about, really about it being um, more about um, arguments happening and passionate arguments happening, but them being about making the product better. Of course. Not have them be about QA says this and engineering says that or any kind of silliness like that. Yeah. Everybody gets totally focused in this kind of environment. Everybody gets totally focused on what we're trying to do here. Right? And the, all, the, all, the, all the aggressive arguments are about making the right decision. right? Not about me versus you or anything else. And that is such an important cultural thing. It goes back to Maslow's hierarchy, right? Like yeah. if you don't have respect for the other people,